From the Conference Center at Temple Square in Salt Lake City, this is the Sunday morning session of the 188th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music for this session is provided by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Russell M. Nelson will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, on this beautiful Easter morning, we welcome you to the Sunday morning session of the 188th Annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It is wonderful to be gathered on this significant day as we remember and celebrate the atonement and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We extend our greetings to all who are participating in these proceedings throughout the world. The music for this session will be provided by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir under the direction of Mac Wilberg with Clay Christiansen and Richard Elliott at the organ. The choir opened this meeting with, on this day of joy and gladness, and will now favor us with, Christ the Lord is risen today. The invocation will then be offered by Elder S. Mark Palmer of the 70, and the choir will sing, He Sent His Son.
Our Father in heaven, we gather together on this glorious Easter Sabbath morning so thankful for the gift of thy Son, for his perfect example, for his atoning sacrifice, and for the sure knowledge that he lives and the hope that that gives each of us of eternal life. We are so grateful to have been able to raise our hands and sustain our beloved prophet, President Nelson, and the others who serve as prophets, seers, and revelators, will thou bless each of them. May they be strengthened by thee as they receive the revelation that is needed to lead this great church. Father, we pray, how we pray, that there will be an outpouring of thy spirit throughout this conference setting, that broken hearts will be healed, and that each of us may learn and feel what is needed to be better disciples of Jesus Christ. We offer this prayer now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
We will next be pleased to hear from Elder Larry Y. Wilson of the Seventy. He will be followed by Sister Reina Isabel of Puerto, second counselor in the Relief Society General Presidency. Elders Massimo De Feo and Claudio D. Civic of the Seventy will then address us. On this Easter Sunday, our thoughts turn to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and to the empty tomb that gives every believer hope in Christ's triumph over otherwise certain defeat. I believe with the Apostle Paul that just as Christ, just as God raised up Christ from the dead, so shall he also quicken our mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in us. To quicken means to make alive. Just as Christ brings our bodies back to life after physical death through the power of his resurrection, so can he also quicken us or make us alive from spiritual death. In the book of Moses, we read of Adam undergoing this kind of quickening. Adam was baptized, and the Spirit of God descended upon him. And thus he was born of the Spirit and became quickened in the inner man. What an incomparable gift comes to those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. That gift is the Holy Spirit giving us what the New Testament calls life in Christ. But do we sometimes take for granted such a gift? Brothers and sisters, it is an extraordinary privilege to have the Holy Spirit for our guide, as demonstrated by the following experience. During the Korean War, Ensign Frank Blair served on a troop transport ship stationed in Japan. The ship wasn't large enough to have a formal chaplain, so the captain asked Brother Blair to be the ship's informal chaplain having observed that the young man was a person of faith and principle, highly respected by the whole crew. Ensign Blair wrote, Our ship was caught in a huge typhoon. The waves were about 45 feet high. I was on watch, during which time one of our three engines stopped working, and a crack in the center line of the ship was reported. We had two remaining engines, one of which was only functioning at half power. We were in serious trouble. Ensign Blair finished his watch and was getting into bed when the captain knocked on his door. He asked, Would you please pray for this ship? Of course, Ensign Blair agreed to do so. At that point, Ensign Blair could have simply prayed, Heavenly Father, please bless our ship and keep us safe, and then gone to bed. Instead, he prayed to know if there was something he could do to help ensure the safety of the ship. In response to Brother Blair's prayer, the Holy Ghost prompted him to go to the bridge, speak with the captain, and learn more. He found that the captain was trying to determine how fast to run the ship's remaining engines. Ensign Blair returned to his cabin to pray again. He prayed, What can I do to help address the problem with the engines? In response, the Holy Ghost whispered that he needed to walk around the ship and observe to gather more information. He again returned to the captain and asked for permission to walk around the deck. Then, with a lifeline tied around his waist, he went out into the storm. Standing on the stern, he observed the giant propellers as they came out of the water when the ship crested a wave. Only one was working fully, and it was spinning very fast. After these observations, Ensign Blair once again prayed. The clear answer he received was that the remaining good engine was under too much strain and needed to be slowed down. So he returned to the captain and made that recommendation. The captain was surprised 
telling him that the ship's engineer had just suggested the opposite, that they increase the speed of the good engine in order to outrun the storm. Nevertheless, the captain chose to follow Ensign Blair's suggestion and slowed the engine down. By dawn, the ship was safely in calm waters. Only two hours later, the good engine stopped working altogether. With half power in the remaining engine, the ship was able to limp into port. The captain said to Ensign Blair, if we had not slowed that engine when we did, we would have lost it in the middle of the storm. Without that engine, there would have been no way to steer. The ship would have overturned and been sunk. The captain thanked the young LDS officer and said he believed that following Ensign Blair's spiritual impressions had saved the crew and the ship. Now, this story is quite dramatic. While we may be unlikely to face such dire circumstances, this story contains important guidelines about how we can receive the Spirit's guidance more frequently. First, when it comes to revelation, we must properly tune our receiver to heaven's frequency. Ensign Blair was living a clean and faithful life. Had he not been obedient, he would not have had the spiritual confidence necessary to pray as he did for the safety of his ship and to receive such specific guidance. We must each be making the effort to align our lives with God's commandments in order to be directed by Him. Sometimes we can't hear Heaven's signal because we are not worthy. Repentance and obedience are the way to achieve clear communication again. The Old Testament word for repent means to turn or turn around. When you feel far from God, you need only make the decision to turn from sin and face the Savior, where you will find Him waiting for you, His arms outstretched. He is eager to guide you, and you are just one prayer away from receiving that guidance again. Second, Ensign Blair did not just ask the Lord to solve his problem. He asked what he could do to be part of the solution. Likewise, we might ask, Lord, what do I need to do to be part of the solution? Instead of just listing our problems in prayer and asking the Lord to solve them, we ought to be seeking more proactive ways of receiving the Lord's help and committing to act according to the Spirit's guidance. There's a third important lesson in Ensign Blair's story. Could he have prayed with such calm assurance if he had not received guidance from the Spirit on previous occasions. The arrival of a typhoon is no time to dust off the gift of the Holy Ghost and figure out how to use it. This young man was clearly following a pattern he had used many times before, including as a full-time missionary. We need the Holy Spirit as our guide in calm waters so his voice will be unmistakable to us in the fiercest storm. Some may think we shouldn't expect daily guidance from the Spirit because it does not meet that God should command in all things, lest we become slothful servants. This scripture, however, was given to some early missionaries who asked Joseph Smith to obtain revelation they should have received for themselves. In a preceding verse, the Lord told them to come to the mission field as they shall counsel between themselves and me. These missionaries wanted a specific revelation about their travel plans. They hadn't yet learned to seek their own direction in personal matters. The Lord called this attitude what it is, sloth. Early church members may have been so happy to have a true prophet that they were in danger of failing to learn how to receive revelation themselves. Being spiritually self-reliant is to be able to hear the Lord's voice through His Spirit for one's own life. Alma advised his son to counsel with the Lord in all thy doings. To live in this way, what we often call living by the Spirit, is a high privilege. It brings a sense of calm and certainty, as well as fruits of the Spirit, such as love, joy, and peace. Ensign Blair's ability to receive revelation saved him and his shipmates from a raging storm. Other kinds of storms are raging today. The Book of Mormon's parable of the Tree of Life provides a powerful image of how to achieve spiritual safety in such a world. 
This dream tells of sudden mists of darkness arising to bring spiritual destruction to members of the Church walking on the path back to God. In contemplating this image, I see in my mind's eye throngs of people traveling that path, some with their hands firmly gripping the iron rod, but many others simply following the feet of the people in front of them. This latter approach takes little thought or effort. You can just do and think what others are doing and thinking. This works fine in sunny weather. But the storms of deception and the mists of falsehood arise without warning. In these situations, being familiar with the voice of the Holy Ghost is a matter of spiritual life and death. Nephi's powerful promise is that whoso would hearken unto the word of God and hold fast unto it would never perish. Neither could the temptations and the fiery darts of the adversary overpower them unto blindness to lead them away to destruction. Following the feet of the people ahead of you on the path is not enough. We cannot just do and think what others are doing and thinking. We must live a guided life. We must each have our own hand on the iron rod. Then we may go to the Lord with humble confidence, knowing that He shall lead us by the hand and give us answer to our prayers. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. One of the most remarkable creatures on earth is the monarch butterfly. On a trip to Mexico to spend Christmas with my husband's family, we visited a butterfly sanctuary where millions of monarch butterflies spend the winter. It was fascinating to see such an impressive sight and for us to reflect on the example of unity and obedience to divine laws that God's creations demonstrate. Monarch butterflies are master navigators. They use the sun's position to find the direction they need to go. Every spring, they travel thousands of miles from Mexico to Canada, and every fall they return to the same sacred fir forests in Mexico. They do this year after year, one tiny wing flap at a time. During their journey, they cluster together at night on trees to protect themselves from the cold and from predators. A group of butterflies is called a kaleidoscope. Isn't that a beautiful image? Each butterfly in a kaleidoscope is unique and different, yet these seemingly fragile creatures have been designed by a loving creator with the ability to survive, travel, multiply, and disseminate life as they go from one flower to the next, spreading pollen. And although each butterfly is different, they work together to make the world a more beautiful and fruitful place. Like the monarch butterflies, we are on a journey back to our heavenly home, where we will reunite with our heavenly parents. Like the butterflies, we have been given divine attributes that allow us to navigate through life in order to feel the measure of our creation. Like them, if we knit our hearts together, the Lord will protect us as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings and will make us into a beautiful kaleidoscope. Girls and boys, young women and young men, sisters and brothers, we are on this journey together. In order to reach our sublime destiny, we need each other and we need to be unified. The Lord has commanded us, be one, and if ye are not one, ye are not mine. Jesus Christ is the ultimate example of unity with his Father. They are one in purpose, in love and in works, with the will of the Son, being swallowed up in the will of the Father. How can we follow the Lord's perfect example of unity with his Father and be more unified with them and with each other? An inspiring pattern is found in Acts 1.14. We read, the men all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. I think it is significant 
that the phrase with one accord appears several times in the book of Acts, where we read about what Jesus Christ's followers did immediately after he ascended to heaven as a resurrected being, as well as the blessings they received because of their efforts. It is also significant that we find a similar pattern among the faithful of the American continent at the time the Lord visited and ministered to them. With one accord means in agreement, in unity, and all together. Some of the things that the faithful saints did in unity in both places were that they testified of Jesus Christ, studied the word of God, and ministered to each other with love. The Lord's followers were one in purpose, in love, and in works. They knew who they were. They knew what they had to do, and they did it with love for God and for each other. They were part of a magnificent kaleidoscope, moving forward with one accord. Some of the blessings they received were that they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Miracles took place among them. The church grew. There was no contention among the people, and the Lord blessed them in all things. We can suppose that the reason why they were so united is because they knew the Lord personally. They had been close to him, and they had been witnesses of his divine mission, of the miracles that he performed, and of his resurrection. They saw and touched the marks in his hands and feet, they knew with certainty that he was the promised Messiah, the redeemer of the world. They knew that he is the source of all healing, peace, and eternal progress. Even though we may not have seen our Savior with our physical eyes, we can know that he lives. As we draw closer to him, as we seek to receive a personal witness through the Holy Ghost of his divine mission, we will have a better understanding of our purpose. The love of God will dwell in our hearts. We will have the determination to be one in the kaleidoscopes of our families, words, and communities, and we will minister to each other in newer, better ways. Miracles happen when the children of God work together, guided by the Spirit, to reach out to others in need. We hear so many stories of neighborly love shown among the people when catastrophe strikes. For example, when the city of Houston suffered a massive flood last year, people forgot about their own needs and went to the rescue. An elders quorum president sent a call for help to the community, and a fleet of 77 boats was quickly organized. Rescuers went around the affected neighborhoods and transported whole families to one of our meeting houses, where they received refuge and much needed help. Members and non-members worked together with one purpose. In Santiago, Chile, a Relief Society president had the desire to help immigrants in her community who had come from Haiti. By counseling together with her priesthood leaders, she and other leaders came up with the idea to offer Spanish classes to those immigrants, helping them integrate better into their new home. Every Saturday morning, missionaries gathered together with their eager students. The feeling of unity in that building is an inspiring example of people from diverse backgrounds serving with one accord. In Mexico, hundreds of members traveled for hours to help the survivors of two major earthquakes. They came with tools, machinery, and love for their neighbor. As volunteers gathered together in one of our meeting houses waiting for instructions, the mayor of the city of Ixhuatan broke down in tears as he saw such a manifestation of the pure love of Christ. The Lord is now giving us the opportunity to counsel together each month in our priesthood quorums and relief societies so we can all be more active participants in our world or branch kaleidoscope, a place where we all fit in and where we are all needed. Every one of our paths is different, yet we walk them together. 
Our path is not about what we have done or where we have been. It is about where we are going and what we are becoming in unity. When we counsel together, guided by the Holy Ghost, we can see where we are and where we need to be. The Holy Ghost gives us a vision that our natural eyes cannot see because revelation is scattered among us. And when we put that revelation together, we can see more. As we work in unity, our purpose should be to look for and do the Lord's will. Our incentive should be the love we feel for God and for our neighbor. And our greatest desire should be to labor diligently so we can prepare the way for the glorious return of our Savior. The only way we will be able to do so is with one accord. Like the monarch butterflies, let us continue on our journey together in purpose, each of us with our own attributes and contributions, working to make this a more beautiful and fruitful world, one small step at a time, and in harmony with God's commandments. Our Lord Jesus Christ has promised us that when we are gathered together in his name, he is in the midst of us. I testify that he lives and that he was resurrected on a beautiful spring morning like today. He is the monarch above all monarchs, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. May we be one in the Father and in his begotten Son as we are guided by the Holy Ghost. It's my humble prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We love and miss President Monson, and we love and sustain our dear President Nelson. President Nelson has a special place in my heart. When I was a young father, a little son who was five came home from school one day and asked his mother, what kind of work does daddy do? He then explained that his new classmates started debating about this, their father's jobs. One said that his father was the chief of the city police, while another proudly declared that his father was the chief of a big company. So when asked about his father, my son simply said, my father works in an office on a computer. Then, noticing that his answer did not impress his new little friends much, he added, and by the way, my father is the chief of the universe. I guess that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> I told my wife, it's time to teach him some more details of the plan of salvation and who is really in charge. But as we taught our children the plan of salvation, their love for Heavenly Father and for the Savior grew as they learned that it is a plan of love. The gospel of Jesus Christ is centered on the love of the Father and the Savior for us and our love for them and for one another. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland said, the first great commandment of all eternity is to love God with all of our heart, might, mind, and strength. That's the first great commandment. But the first great truth of all eternity is that God loves us with all of his heart, might, mind, and strength. That love is the foundation stone of eternity, and it should be the foundation stone of our daily life." End quote. Being the foundation stone of our daily life, pure love is a requirement for every true disciple of Jesus Christ. The prophet Mormon taught, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, Pray unto the Father with all the energy of heart that ye may be filled with this love which he hath bestowed upon all who are true followers of his Son, Jesus Christ. Love indeed is the true sign of every true disciple of Jesus Christ. True disciples love to serve. They know that serving is an expression of true love and a covenant they may be baptism, regardless of their callings in the church or their role in the community, 
they feel an increasing desire to love and serve the Lord and one another. Two disciples love to forgive. They know that the atonement of the Savior covers all sins and mistakes of each one of us. They know that the price he paid is an all-included price. Spiritual taxes, fees, commissions, and charges related to sins, mistakes, or wrongdoings are all covered. Two disciples are quick to forgive and quick to ask for forgiveness. My dear brothers and sisters, if you are struggling to find the strength to forgive, don't think of what others have done to you, but think of what the Lord has done for you, and you will find peace in the redemptive blessings of his atonement. True disciples love to submit themselves to the Lord with peace in their heart. They are humble and submissive because they love him. They have faith to fully accept his will, not only in what he does, but also in how and when. True disciples know that the real blessings are not always what they want, but rather what the Lord wants for them. True disciples love the Lord more than the world and are steadfast and immovable in their faith. They stay strong and firm in a changing and confusing world. True disciples love to listen to the voice of the Spirit and of the prophets and are not confused by the voices of the world. True disciples love to stand in holy places and love to make holy the places where they stand. Wherever they go, they bring the love of the Lord and peace to the hearts of others. True disciples love to obey the Lord's commandments, and they obey because they love the Lord. As they love and keep their covenants, their hearts are renewed and their very nature changes. Pure love is the true sign of every true disciple of Jesus Christ. I learned about pure love from my mother. She was not a member of the church. One day, many years ago, I visited my mother who was struggling with cancer. I knew that she was going to die, but I was concerned that she was suffering. I didn't say anything, but knowing me well, she said, I see that you are concerned. Then, to my surprise, she asked me with a feeble voice, can you teach me how to pray? I want to pray for you. I know you start by saying, dear Heavenly Father, but then what should I say? As I knelt next to her bed and she prayed for me, I felt a love never felt before. It was simple, true, pure love. Although she didn't know about the plan of salvation, she had in her heart her personal plan of love, the plan of love of a mother for her son. She was in pain, struggling to even find the strength to pray. I could barely hear her voice, but I surely felt her love. I remember thinking, how can someone who is in such great pain pray for someone else? She is the one in need. Then the answer came clearly to my mind. Pure love. She loved me so much that she forgot about herself. In her most critical hour, she loved me more than herself. Now, dear brothers and sisters, isn't this what the Savior did? Of course, in an eternal and much broader perspective, but in the midst of his greatest pain, in the garden, that night. He was the one who needed help, suffering in a way that we cannot even imagine or comprehend. But in the end, he forgot about himself and prayed for us until he paid the full price. How was he able to do it? Because of his pure love for the Father who sent him and for us. He loved the Father and us more than himself. 
He paid for something that he had not done. He paid for sins that he had not committed. Why? Pure love. Having paid the full price, he was in a position to offer us the blessings of what he paid for if we would repent. Why did he offer this? Again and always, pure love. Pure love is the true sign of every true disciple of Jesus Christ. President Thomas S. Monson said, quote, May we begin now, this very day, to express love to all of God's children, whether they be our family members, our friends, mere acquaintances, or total strangers. As we arise each morning, let us determine to respond with love and kindness to whatever might come our way." End quote. Brothers and sisters, the gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of love. The greatest commandment is about love. For me, it's all about love. The love of the Father who sacrificed His Son for us, the love of the Savior who sacrificed all for us, the love of a mother or a father who would give anything for their children, the love of those who serve silently and are not known to most of us but are well known to the Lord, the love of those who forgive all and always, the love of the ones who give more than they receive. I love my Heavenly Father. I love my Savior. I love the Gospel. I love this church. I love my family. I love this wonderful life. For me, it's all about love. May this day of remembrance of the resurrection of the Savior be a day of spiritual renewal for each one of us. May this day be the beginning of a life full of love, the foundation stone of our daily life. May our hearts be filled with the pure love of Christ, the true sign of every true disciple of Jesus Christ. It is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, I appreciate very much the opportunity to express to you some of my feelings. Several years ago, my wife and I were present at the inaugural ceremony of the Interactive Children exhibit in the Church History Museum in Salt Lake City. At the end of the ceremony, President Thomas S. Monson walked towards us, and as he shook our hands, he said, Endure, and you shall triumph. A profound teaching, and one which truth, of course, we can all affirm. Jesus Christ assured us that he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. To endure means to remain firm in a commitment to be true to the commandments of God, despite temptation, opposition, or adversity. Even those who have had powerful spiritual experiences and have given faithful service could one day go astray or fall into inactivity if they do not endure to the end. May we always and emphatically keep in our minds and hearts the phrase, this will not happen to me. When Jesus Christ taught in Capernaum, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? I believe that today Jesus Christ asked all of us who had made sacred covenants with him, Will ye also go away? I pray that all of us, with profound reflection about what the eternities hold for us, may respond as did Simon Peter, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Let us be faithful to what we have believed and know. If we have not been living according to our knowledge, let us change. Sinners who persist in their sins and do not repent sink deeper and deeper into filthiness 
until Satan claims them for himself, significant to jeopardize and their opportunity to repent, to be forgiven, and to be blessed with all the blessings of eternity. I have heard many justifications for those who have stopped participating actively in the church and have lost the correct vision of the purpose of our journey on this earth. I exhort them to reflect and to return because I believe that no one will be able to make excuses before our Lord Jesus Christ. When we were baptized, we made covenants, not with any man, but with the Savior, agreeing to take upon ourselves the name of Jesus Christ, having a determination to serve him to the end. Attendance at sacrament meeting is one of the key ways we can evaluate our determination to serve him, our spiritual fortitude, and the growth of our faith in Jesus Christ. Partaking of the sacrament is the most important thing we do on the Sabbath day. The Lord explained these ordinances to his apostles just before he died. He did the same on the American continent. He tells us that if we participate in this ordinance, it will be a testimony to the Father that we always remember him, and he promises that accordingly we will have his spirit to be with us. In the teaching of Alma the Younger to his son Shiblon, we find wise counsel and warnings that help us remain faithful to our covenants. See that ye are now lifted, lifted up and to pray. Yes, see that ye do not boast in your own wisdom nor of your much strength. You smallness, but not overbearance. And also see that ye bridle all your passions, that ye may be filled with love. See that ye refrain from idleness. Several years ago, while on vacation, I wanted to go kayaking for the first time. I rented a kayak, and full of enthusiasm, I launched into the sea. After a few minutes, I overturned the kayak with a great deal of effort, holding a paddle in one hand and the kayak in the other, I could regain my footing. I try again to paddle my kayak, but just a few minutes later, the kayak tipped over again. I stubbornly kept on trying to not bail until someone who understood kayaking told me that there must be a crack in the shell and the kayak must be half filled up with water, making it unstable and impossible to control. I dragged the kayak to the shore and removed the plug and sure enough obtained a large amount of water. I think that at times we move through life with sins that, like the leak in my kayak, impede our spiritual progress. If we persist in our sins, we forget the covenants we have made with the Lord. Even though we keep capsizing because of the imbalance that those sins create in our lives. Like the cracks in my kayak, the cracks in our lives need to be deal with. Some sins will require more efforts than others to repent of. We should therefore ask ourselves, where are we regarding our attitude toward the Savior and his work? Are we in Peter's situation when he denied Jesus Christ? Or have we advanced to the point where we have the attitude and determination he had after the great commission he received from the Savior? We must strive to obey all the commandments that pay close attention to those that are hardest for us to keep. 
The Lord will be at our side, helping us in times of need and weakness. And if we demonstrate a sincere desire and act accordingly, we will make weak things become strong. Obedience will, be, will give us the strength to overcome sin. We must also understand that the trial of our faith requires us to obey, often without knowing the results. I suggest a formula that will help us endure to the end. Daily pray and read the scriptures. Weekly partake of the sacrament with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Pay our tithe and our monthly fast offering. Every two years, every year for the youth, renew our temple recommends. Throughout our whole lives, serve in the work of the Lord. May the great truth of the gospel steady our minds, and may we keep our life free of the cracks that can impede our safe journey through the sea of this life. Success in the Lord's way has a price, and the only way to achieve it is to pay that price. How grateful I am that our Savior endured unto the end, completing his great atoning sacrifice. He suffered for our sins, pains, depressions, anguish, infirmities, and fears, and so he knows how to help us how to inspire us, how to come for us, and how to strengthen us so that we may endure and obtain the crown that is reserved for those who are not defeated. Life is different for each of us. We all have a time of trials, a time for happiness, a time for making decisions, a time for overcoming obstacles, and a time for taking advantage of opportunities. Whatever our personal situation may be, I testify that our Heavenly Father is constantly saying, I love you. I sustain you. I am with you. Do not give up. Repent and endure in the path that I have shown you. And I assure you that we will see each other again in our celestial home. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. We are grateful to Sister Alberto, Elders Wilson, DeFeo, and Civic for their marvelous messages. Just think of it, brothers and sisters. These wonderful disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, natives of North America, Central America, South America, and Europe, have instructed us and inspired us with one message as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep his commandments, and we'll be all right. Now the congregation will sing with the choir, Rejoice, the Lord is King. After the singing, we'll be pleased to hear from President Henry B. Eyring, second counselor in the first presidency. He will be followed by President Dallin H. Oaks, first counselor in the first presidency. This is the 188th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.
My brothers and sisters, I rejoice with you today for the experience we've had together in this great conference. I am grateful for the opportunity to speak to you on the Lord's Sabbath in the general conference of His Church at this Easter season. I thank our Heavenly Father for the gift of His beloved Son, who came voluntarily to earth to be our Redeemer. I am grateful to know that He atoned for our sins and rose in the resurrection. Every day, I am blessed to know that because of His atonement, I may someday be resurrected to live forever in a loving family. I know those things by the only way any of us can know them. The Holy Ghost has spoken to my mind and heart that they are true, not just once, but often. I have needed that continuing comfort. We all experience tragedy during which we need the reassurance of the Spirit. I felt it one day as I stood with my father in a hospital. We watched my mother take a few shallow breaths and then no more. As we looked on her face, she was smiling as the pain left. After a few silent moments, my father spoke first. He said, a little girl has gone home. He said it softly. He seemed to be at peace, almost joyful. He was reporting something he knew was true. He quietly began to gather mother's personal things. He went out into the hospital hallway to thank each of the nurses and doctors who had ministered to her for days. My father had the companionship of the Holy Ghost at that moment to feel, to know, and do what he did that day. He had received the promise, as many have, that they may have his spirit to be with them. My simple hope today is to increase your desire and your ability to receive the Holy Ghost. Remember, he is the third member of the Godhead. The Father and the Son are resurrected beings. The Holy Ghost is a person of spirit. It is your choice whether to receive him and welcome him into your heart and mind. The conditions on which we can receive that supernal blessing are made clear in the words that are spoken every week, but perhaps do not always sink into our hearts and minds. To have the Spirit sent to us, we must always remember the Savior and keep his commandments. This time of year helps us remember the Savior's sacrifice and his rising from the tomb, a resurrected being. Many of us hold those images of those scenes in our memories. I once stood with my wife outside a tomb in Jerusalem. Many believe that it was the tomb from which the crucified Savior emerged as a resurrected and living God. The respectful guide that day motioned with his hand and said to us, come, see an empty tomb. We stooped to enter. We saw a stone bench against a wall, but in my mind came another picture, as real as what we saw that day. It was of Mary, who was left by the apostles at the tomb. That is what the Spirit let me see, and even hear in my mind, as clearly as if I had been there. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white, sitting the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they had, have laid him. 
And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. I have prayed to be allowed to feel something of what Mary felt at the tomb as she recognized the Savior, and what two other disciples felt on the road to Emmaus as they walked with the resurrected Savior, thinking him a visitor to Jerusalem. You remember the account, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Some of those words were repeated in a sacrament meeting I attended more than 70 years ago. In those ancient days, sacrament meetings were held sometimes in the evening. It was dark outside. The congregation sang these familiar words. I had heard them many times. But my lasting memory is of a feeling on one particular night. It draws me closer to the Savior. Perhaps if I recite the words, it will come to all of us again. Abide with me, tis eventide, the day is past and gone. The shadows of the evening fall, the night is coming on. Within my heart, a welcome guest within my home abide. Abide with me, tis eventide, thy walk today with me has made my heart within me burn. As I commune with thee, thy earnest words have filled my soul and kept me near thy side, O Savior. Stay this night with me. Behold, tis even died, O Savior. Stay this night with me. Behold, tis even died. More precious than a memory or a picture of the events of that day, more important is the memory of the Holy Ghost touching our hearts and his continuing affirmation of truth. More precious than seeing with our eyes or remembering words spoken and read is recalling the feelings that accompanied the quiet voice of the Spirit. Rarely I have felt it exactly as the travelers on the road to Emmaus did, as a soft but clear burning in the heart. More often, it is a feeling of light and quiet assurance. We have the priceless promise of the Holy Ghost as a companion, and we also have true directions on how to claim that gift. These words are said by the Lord's authorized servant with his hands on our head. Receive the Holy Ghost. At that moment, you and I have the assurance he will be sent. But our obligation is to choose to open our hearts to receive the ministration of the Spirit over a lifetime. The experiences of the prophet Joseph Smith offer a guide. He began and continued his ministry with the decision that his own wisdom was not sufficient to know what course he should pursue. He chose 
to be humble before God. Next, Joseph chose to ask of God. He prayed in faith that God would answer. The answer came when he was a young boy. Those messages came when he needed to know how God would have his church established. The Holy Ghost comforted and guided him throughout his life. He obeyed inspiration when it was difficult. For instance, he received direction to send the Twelve to England when he needed them most. He sent them. He accepted correction and comfort from the Spirit when he was imprisoned and the saints were terribly oppressed. And he obeyed when he went down the road to Carthage, even as he knew he faced mortal danger. The prophet Joseph set an example for us of how to receive continual spiritual direction and comfort through the Holy Ghost. The first choice he made was to be humble before God. The second was to pray with faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The third was to obey exactly. Obedience may mean to move quickly. It may mean to prepare. Or it may mean to wait in patience for further inspiration. And the fourth is to pray to know the needs and the hearts of others and how to help them for the Lord. Joseph prayed for the saints in distress when he was in prison. It has been my opportunity to observe the prophets of God as they pray, ask for inspiration, receive direction, and act on it. I have seen how often their prayers are about the people they love and serve. Their concern for others seems to open their hearts to receive inspiration. That can be true for you. Inspiration will help us minister to others for the Lord. You have seen that in your own experience, as I have. My bishop once said to me at a time when my wife was under great strain in her own life, he said, every time I hear of someone in the ward who needs help, when I get there to help, I find that your wife was there ahead of me. How does she do that? Well, she was like all who are great ministers in the Lord's kingdom. It seems there are two things they do. Great ministers have qualified for the Holy Ghost as a nearly constant companion. And they have qualified for the gift of charity, which is the pure love of Christ. Those gifts have grown in them as they have used them in serving out of love for the Lord. The way in which prayer, inspiration, and love of the Lord work together in our service to Him is described for me perfectly in these words. Quote, if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. I bear my personal witness that the Father is at this moment aware of you, your feelings, and the spiritual and temporal needs of everyone around you. I bear testimony that the Father and the Son are sending the Holy Ghost to all who have that gift and ask for that blessing and seek to be worthy of it Neither the Father, nor the Son, nor the Holy Ghost force themselves into our lives. We are free to choose.
the Lord has said to all, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith. I pray with all my heart that you will hear the voice of the Spirit, which is sent to you so generously. And I pray that you will open your hearts always to receive him. If you ask with real intent and with faith in Jesus Christ for inspiration, you will receive it in the Lord's way and in his time. God did that for the young Joseph Smith. He does it today for our living prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. He has placed you in the way of other children of God to serve them for him. I know that not only by what I have seen with my eyes, but more powerfully by what the Spirit has whispered to my heart. I have felt the love of the Father and of His beloved Son for all the children of God in the world and for His children in the spirit world. I have felt the comfort and the direction of the Holy Ghost. I pray that you may have the joy of having the Spirit with you as your companion constantly. In the name of of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 My dear brothers and sisters, like you, I have been profoundly touched and edified and inspired by the messages and music and the feelings of this time together. I'm sure I speak for you in expressing thanks to our brothers and sisters who, as instruments in the hands of the Lord, have given us the strengthening effect of this time together. I'm grateful to speak to this audience on Easter Sunday. Today, we join other Christians in celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. For members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ is a pillar of our faith. Because we believe the accounts in both the Bible and the Book of Mormon about the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ, we also believe the numerous scriptural teachings that a similar resurrection will come to all mortals who have ever lived upon this earth. That resurrection gives us what the Apostle Peter called a lively hope. That lively hope is our conviction that death is not the conclusion of our identity, but merely a necessary step in our Heavenly Father's merciful plan for the salvation of His children. That plan calls for a transition from mortality to immortality. Central to that transition is the sunset of death and the glorious morning made possible by the resurrection of our Lord and Savior that we celebrate on this Easter Sunday. In a great hymn whose words were written by Eliza R. Snow, we sing, How great, how glorious, how complete, redemption's grand design, where justice, love, and mercy meet in harmony divine. In furtherance of that divine design and harmony, we assemble in meetings, including this conference, to teach and encourage one another. 
This morning, I have felt to use as my text Alma's teaching to his son Helaman, recorded in the Book of Mormon. By small and simple things are great things brought to pass. We are taught many small and simple things in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to be reminded that in total and over a significant period of time, these seemingly small things bring to pass great things. There have been many talks on this subject by general authorities and by other respected teachers. The subject is so important that I feel to speak of it again. I was reminded of the power of small and simple things over time by something I saw on a morning walk. Here is the picture I took. The thick and strong concrete sidewalk is cracking. Is this the result of some large and powerful thrust? No. This cracking is caused by the slow, small growth of one of the roots reaching out from the adjoining tree. Here is a similar example I saw on another street. The thrusting power that cracked these heavy concrete sidewalks was too small to measure on a daily or even a monthly basis, but its effect over time was incredibly powerful. So is the powerful effect over time of the small and simple things we are taught in the scriptures and by living prophets. Consider the scripture study we've been taught to incorporate into our daily lives. Or consider the personal prayers and the kneeling family prayers that are regular practices for faithful Latter-day Saints. Consider attendance at seminary for youth or institute classes for young adults. Though each of these practices may seem to be small and simple, over time they result in powerful spiritual uplift and growth. This occurs because each of these small and simple things invites the companionship of the Holy Ghost, the testifier who enlightens us and guides us into truth, as President Eyring has explained. Another source of spiritual uplift and growth is an ongoing practice of repenting, even of seemingly small transgressions. Our own inspired self-evaluations can help us see how we have fallen short and how we can do better. Such repentance should precede our weekly partaking of the sacrament. Some subjects to consider in this process of repentance are suggested in the hymn, Have I Done Any Good? Have I done any good in the world today? Have I helped anyone in need? Have I cheered up the sad and feel, helped someone feel glad? If not, I have failed indeed. Has anyone's burden been lighter today because I was willing to share? Have the sick and the weary been helped on their way? When they needed my help, was I there? Surely these are small things, but surely they are good examples of what Alma taught his son Helaman. And the Lord God doth work by means to bring about his great and eternal purposes. And by very small means, the Lord bringeth about the salvation of many souls. President Stephen C. Wheelwright gave an audience at Brigham Young University, Hawaii, this inspired description of Alma's teaching, quote, Alma confirms for his son that indeed the pattern the Lord follows when, he exer when we exercise faith in him and follow his counsel in the small and simple things is that he blesses us with small daily miracles 
and over time with marvelous works." End of quote. Elder Howard W. Hunter taught that frequently it is the commonplace tasks that have the greatest positive effect on the lives of others as compared with the things the world so often relates to greatness. A persuasive secular teaching of this same principle comes from former Senator Dan Coates of Indiana, who wrote, quote, The only preparation for that one profound decision which can change a life or even a nation is those hundreds and thousands of half-conscious, self-defining, seemingly insignificant decisions made in private. End of quote. Those seemingly insignificant private decisions include how we use our time, what we view on television and the internet, what we read, the art and music with which we surround ourselves at work and at home, what we seek for entertainment, and how we apply our commitment to be honest and truthful. Another seemingly small and simple thing is being civil and cheerful in our personal interactions. None of these desirable small and simple things will lift us to great things unless they are practiced consistently and continuously. President Brigham Young was reported as saying, our lives are made up of little simple circumstances that amount to a great deal when they are brought together and sum up the whole life of the man or woman." End of quote. We are surrounded by media influences and cultural deteriorations that will carry us downstream in our values if we are not continually resisting. To move upstream toward our eternal goal, we must constantly keep paddling. It helps if we're part of a team who are paddling together, like a rowing crew in action. To extend that example even further, the cultural currents are so strong that if we ever stop paddling, we will be carried downstream toward a destination we do not seek but which becomes inevitable if we do not constantly try to move forward. After reciting a seemingly small event that had great consequences, Nephi wrote, And thus we see that by small means the Lord can bring about great things. The Old Testament includes a memorable example of this. There we read how the Israelites were plagued by fiery serpents. Many people died from their bites. When Moses prayed for relief, he was inspired to make a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. Then, if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Such a small thing for such a miraculous result. Yet, as Nephi explained when he taught this example to those who were rebelling against the Lord, even when the Lord had prepared a simple way by which they could be healed, quote, because of the simpleness of the way or the easiness of it, there were many who perished, end of quote. That example and that teaching remind us that the simplicity of the way or the easiness of the commanded task cannot mean that it is unimportant to achieve our righteous desire. Similarly, even small acts of disobedience or minor failures to follow righteous practices can draw us down toward an outcome we have been warned to avoid. The Word of Wisdom provides an example of this. Likely the effect on the body of one cigarette or one drink of alcohol or one dose of another drug cannot be measured. But over time, the effect is powerful and may be irreversible. 
Remember the cracking of the sidewalk by the gradual small expansions of the root of the tree. One thing is certain, the terrible consequences of partaking of anything that can become addictive, like drugs that attack our bodies or pornographic material that degrades our thoughts, is totally avoidable if we never partake for the first time, even once. Many years ago, Elder M. Russell Ballard described to a general conference audience how small and simple things can be negative and destructive to a person's salvation. He taught, like weak fibers that form a yarn, then a strand, and finally a rope, these small things combined together can become too strong to be broken. We must ever be aware of the power that the small and simple things can have in building spirituality, he said. At the same time, we must be aware that Satan will use small and simple things to lead us into despair and misery." End of quote. President Wheelwright gave a similar caution to his BYU-Hawaii audience. Quote, it is in failing to do the small and simple things that faith wavers, miracles cease, and progress toward the Lord and His kingdom is first put on hold, then begins to unravel as seeking after the kingdom of God is replaced with more temporal pursuits and worldly ambitions." End of quote. To protect against the cumulative negative effects that are destructive to our spiritual progress, we need to follow the spiritual pattern of small and simple things. Elder David A. Bednar described this principle in a BYU Women's Conference. Quote, We can learn much about the nature and importance of this spiritual pattern from the technique of dripping water onto the soil at very low rates, in contrast to flooding or spraying large quantities of water where it may not be needed. He explained, the steady drips of water sink deep into the ground and provide a high moisture level in the soil wherein plants can flourish. In like manner, if you and I are focused and frequent in receiving consistent drops of spiritual nourishment, then gospel roots and can sink deep into our soul, can become firmly established and grounded, and produce extraordinary and delicious fruit. Continuing, he said, the spiritual pattern of small and simple things bringing forth great things produces firmness and steadfastness, deepening devotion and more complete conversion to the gospel of Jesus Christ." End of quote. The prophet Joseph Smith taught this principle in words now included in the Doctrine and Covenants. Let no man count them as simple things, for there is much pertaining to the saints which depends upon these things. In connection with the earliest attempts to establish the Church in Missouri, the Lord counseled patience for all things must come to pass in their time. Then He gave this great teaching, Wherefore be not weary in well-doing, for ye are laying the foundation of a great work, and out of small things proceedeth that which is great. End of quote. I believe we all desire to follow President Russell M. Nelson's challenge to press forward on the covenant path. Our commitment to do so is strengthened by consistently following the small things we are taught by the gospel of Jesus Christ and the leaders of His Church. I testify of Him and invoke His blessings on all who seek to keep on His covenant path. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. We are grateful to President Eyring and President Oaks for their inspired messages, and to the Mormon Tabernacle Choir for the beautiful music they have provided this Easter morning. It will now be my privilege to speak to you, brothers and sisters, 
Following my remarks, the choir will sing, He is Risen. The benediction will then be offered by Elder Joaquin Costa of the Seventy. What a glorious privilege it has been to celebrate Easter with you on this Sunday of General Conference. Nothing could be more fitting than to commemorate the most important event that ever occurred on this earth by worshiping the most important being who ever walked this earth. In this, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we worship him who commenced his infinite atonement in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was willing to suffer for the sins and weaknesses of each of us, which suffering caused him to bleed at every pore. He was crucified on Calvary's cross and rose the third day as the first resurrected being of our Heavenly Father's children. I love him and testify that he lives. It is he who leads and guides his Church. Without our Redeemer's infinite atonement, not one of us would have hope of ever returning to our Heavenly Father. Without His resurrection, death would be the end. Our Savior's atonement made eternal life a possibility and immortality a reality for all. It is because of His transcendent mission and the peace He grants His followers that my wife Wendy and I felt comfort late on January 2nd, 2018, when we were awakened by a phone call telling us that President Thomas S. Monson had stepped through the veil. How we miss President Monson. We honor his life and his legacy. A spiritual giant he left an indelible imprint upon all who knew him and upon the Church that he loved. On Sunday, January 14, 2018, in the upper room of the Salt Lake Temple, the First Presidency was reorganized in the simple yet sacred pattern established by the Lord. Then, at yesterday morning's solemn assembly, Members of the Church throughout the world raised their hands to confirm the earlier action taken by the Apostles. I am humbly grateful for your sustaining support. I am also grateful for those upon whose shoulders I stand. It has been my privilege to serve in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles for 34 years and to know personally ten of the sixteen previous presidents of the Church. I learned much from each of them. I also owe much to my forebears. All eight of my great-grandparents were converts to the Church in Europe. Each of these stalwart souls sacrificed everything to come to Zion. During subsequent generations, however, not all my ancestors remained so committed. As a result, I was not raised in a gospel-centered home. I adored my parents. They meant the world to me and taught me crucial lessons. I cannot thank them enough for the happy home life they created for me and my siblings. And yet, even as a boy, I knew I was missing something. One day I jumped on the streetcar went to an LDS bookstore to find a book about the Church. I loved learning about the Gospel. As I came to understand the Word of Wisdom, I wanted my parents to live that law. So one day, when I was very young, I went to our basement and smashed on the concrete floor every bottle of liquor. <laughs> I expected my father to punish me, but he never said a word. As I matured and began to understand the magnificence of Heavenly Father's plan, 
I often said to myself, I don't want one more Christmas present. I just want to be sealed to my parents. That longed for event did not happen until my parents were past 80, and then it did happen. I cannot fully express the joy that I felt that day, and each day I feel that joy of their sealing and my sealing to them. In 1945, while I was in medical school, I married Dancel White in the Salt Lake Temple. She and I were blessed with nine splendid daughters and one precious son. <laughs> El ultimo. <laughs> Today, our ever-growing family is one of the greatest joys of my life. In 2005, after nearly 60 years of marriage, my dear Dancel was unexpectedly called home. For a season, my grief was almost immobilizing. But the message of Easter and the promise of resurrection sustained me. Then the Lord brought Wendy Watson to my side. We were sealed in the Salt Lake Temple on April 6, 2006. How I love her. She's an extraordinary woman, a great blessing to me, to our family, and to the entire Church. Each of these blessings has come as a result of seeking and heeding the promptings of the Holy Ghost. Said President Lorenzo Snow, this is the grand privilege of every Latter-day Saint that it is our right to have the manifestations of the Spirit every day of our lives. End of quote. One of the things the Spirit has repeatedly impressed upon my mind since my new calling as President of the Church is how willing the Lord is to reveal His mind and will. The privilege of receiving revelation is one of the greatest gifts of God to His children. Through the manifestations of the Holy Ghost, the Lord will assist us in all our righteous pursuits. I remember in an operating room, I have stood over a patient, unsure how to perform an unprecedented procedure, and experienced the Holy Ghost diagramming the technique in my mind. To strengthen my proposal to Wendy, I said to her, I know how to how, I know about revelation, how to receive it. To her credit, and as I have come to learn, typical of her, she had already sought and received her own revelation about us, which gave her the courage to say, yes. <laughs> as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, I prayed daily for revelation and gave thanks to the Lord every time He spoke to my heart and mind. Imagine the miracle of it. Whatever our Church calling, we can pray to our Heavenly Father and receive guidance and direction, be warned about dangers and distractions, and be enabled to accomplish things we simply could not do on our own. If we will truly receive the Holy Ghost and learn to discern and understand His promptings, we will be guided in matters large and small. When I recently faced the daunting task of choosing two counselors, I wondered how I could possibly choose just two from twelve men whom I love and respect because I know that good inspiration is based upon good information, I prayerfully met one-on-one -on -one with each apostle. I then sequestered myself in a private room in the temple and sought the Lord's will. I testify that the Lord instructed me 
to select President Dallin H. Oaks and President Henry B. Eyring to serve as my counselors in the First Presidency. In like manner, I testify that the Lord inspired the call of Elder Garrett W. Gong and Elder Ulysses Suarez to be ordained as his apostles. I and we welcome them to this unique brotherhood of service. When we convene as a Council of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve, our meeting rooms become rooms of revelation. The Spirit is palpably present. As we wrestle with complex matters, a thrilling process unfolds as each apostle freely expresses his thoughts and point of view. Though we may differ in our initial perspectives, the love we feel for each other is constant. Our unity helps us to discern the Lord's will for His Church. In our meetings, the majority never rules. We listen prayerfully to one another and talk with each other until we are united. Then, when we have reached complete accord, the unifying influence of the Holy Ghost is spine-tingling. We experience what the Prophet Joseph Smith knew when he taught, by union of feeling, we obtain power with God. No member of the First Presidency or Quorum of the Twelve would ever leave decisions for the Lord's Church to his own best judgment. Brothers and sisters, how can we become the men and women, the Christ-like servants the Lord needs us to be? How can we find answers to questions that perplex us? If Joseph Smith's transcendent experience in the Sacred Grove teaches us anything, it is that the heavens are open and that God speaks to His children. The Prophet Joseph Smith set a pattern for us to follow in resolving our questions. Drawn to the promise of James that if we lack wisdom, we may ask of God, the boy Joseph took his question directly to Heavenly Father. He sought personal revelation, and his seeking opened this last dispensation. In like manner, what will you your seeking open for you. What wisdom do you lack? What do you feel an urgent need to know or understand? Follow the example of the Prophet Joseph. Find a quiet place where you can regularly go. Humble yourself before God. Pour out your heart to your Heavenly Father. Turn to Him for answers and for comfort. Pray in the name of Jesus Christ about your concerns, your fears, your weaknesses. Yes, the very longings of your heart. And then listen. Write the thoughts that come to your mind. Record your feelings and follow through with actions that you are prompted to take. As you repeat this process day after day, Month after month, year after year, you will grow into the principle of revelation. Does God really want to speak to you? Yes. As well as might man stretch forth his puny arm to stop the Missouri River in its decreed course, as to hinder the Almighty from pouring down knowledge from heaven upon the heads of the Latter-day Saints. You don't have to wonder about what is true. You do not have to wonder whom you can safely trust. Through personal revelation, you can receive your own witness that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God, that Joseph Smith is a prophet of this dispensation, and that this is the Lord's Church. Regardless of what others may say or do, no one 
can ever take away a witness born to your heart and mind about what is true. I urge you to stretch beyond your current spiritual ability to receive personal revelation. For the Lord has promised that if thou shalt seek, thou shalt receive revelation upon revelation, knowledge upon knowledge, that thou mayest know the mysteries and peaceable things, that which bringeth joy, that which bringeth life eternal. Well, there's so much more that your Father in heaven wants you to know. As Elder Neil A. Maxwell taught, to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, it is clear that the Father and the Son are giving away the secrets of the universe. Nothing opens the heavens quite like the combination of increased purity, exact obedience, earnest seeking, daily feasting on the words of Christ in the Book of Mormon, and regular time committed to temple and family history work. Well, to be sure, there may be times when you feel as though the heavens are closed, but I promise that as you continue to be obedient, expressing gratitude for every blessing the Lord gives you, and as you patiently honor the Lord's timetable, you will be given the knowledge and understanding you seek. Every blessing the Lord has for you, even miracles, will follow. That is what personal revelation will do for you. I am optimistic about the future. It will be filled with opportunities for each of us to progress, contribute, and take the gospel to every corner of the earth. But I am also not naive about the days ahead. We live in a world that is complex and increasingly contentious. The constant availability of social media and a 24-hour news cycle bombard us with relentless messages. If we are to have any hope of sifting through the myriad of voices and the philosophies of men that attack truth, we must learn to receive revelation. Our Savior and Redeemer Jesus Christ will perform some of his mightiest works between now and when he comes again. We will see miraculous indications that God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, preside over this church in majesty and glory. But in coming days, it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. My beloved brothers and sisters, I plead with you to increase your spiritual capacity to receive revelation. Let this Easter Sunday be a defining moment in your life. Choose to do the spiritual work required to enjoy the gift of the Holy Ghost and hear the voice of the Spirit more frequently and more clearly. With Moroni, I exhort you on this Easter Sabbath to come unto Christ and lay hold upon every good gift, beginning with the gift of the Holy Ghost, which gift can and will change your life. We are followers of Jesus Christ. The most important truth the Holy Ghost will ever witness to you is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He lives. He is our advocate with the Father, our exemplar, and our Redeemer. On this Easter Sunday, we commemorate his atoning sacrifice, his literal resurrection, and his divinity. This is his church, restored through the prophet Joseph Smith. I so testify with my expression of love for each of you. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
our dear and kind Heavenly Father. We love thee, Father. We love thy Son, Jesus Christ, and we thank thee for this great opportunity we've had to listen to thy prophet, to feel his love for us, to feel his big heart towards all of us. We thank thee, Father, for thy Son, Jesus Christ. We thank thee for thy church that, and thy Son's atonement. We thank thee, Father, and we, we pray that revelation may come to us and that we may be closer to thee, that thou may strengthen us as we ask thee in prayer to be closer to thy Son, Jesus Christ, and to thee. We humbly say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the 188th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music was provided by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited.